Engine performance one test five. Okay. Let me bring the questions on here. We got a total of 11 questions on this test. There are not too many here. Uh, following statements are correct except what? We got one question. A is antioxidants reduce high temperature contaminants. Contaminants. Poor point depressants allow oil to flow at lower temperatures. Detergents reduce acid that causes bearing corrosion or viscosity index improves. Improvers reduce the change in viscosity as the oil changes temperatures. You might have noticed that in our um, studies that engine repair and engine performance, some of the tasks and some of the stuff is the same because they're sort of interlaced. Uh, engine performance is also interlaced with emissions. So emissions and engine performance and engine repair are very closely associated with each other. And for that reason, you're going to see a lot of the same questions turn up when we're talking about oil uh, and all that. So um, there is one time over in Savannah, whenever we went to Keller's Flea Market, and you know where that is because you were at Fort Stewart for a while, um, there was a little Iron Duke engine that they had that come out of an old GM car of some kind. And they had it mounted on a little stand up on a trailer. And they fired that thing up. It had a little carburetor on it, a little four-cylinder engine, a little, you know, plain old four-cylinder. And while it was idling, sitting there idling, and they had a little gas tank over there, they took, they drained the oil out of it while it was idling. And they took the oil pan off of it. And then they took the little side cover off of it, you know, for the, for the lifter door. And then they took the valve cover off of it. And it sat there and it ran all day. Golly. With no oil. But they were demonstrating some kind of additive they had that would coated the part en engine parts with Teflon and all that kind of stuff. But I saw that. I mean, I didn't hear about it. I saw it. And uh, I mean, I watched them take. The, I watched them drain the oil while the engine was running. I watched them pull the little pan off. And they had that stuff with that thing sitting there running with no oil pan, no oil cover, and everything. You know, it was just an interest. They had a cooling system hooked to it. Now they had a radiator and a radiator, and, and they had coolant circulating to carry the heat away. But they didn't have any lubrication in there. And you know that's just there's there's actually some things moving in that direction now technology wise you know okay um, detergents reduce acid it causes bearing corrosion that's that's the one that's uh, not true the following statements are correct except all fully synthetic oils are manufactured compared to conventional oil which is refined from crude, crude oil. Okay. B, all synthetic oils may be mixed without causing problems. C, the major disadvantages of synthetic oil are the cost. And D, synthetic oil has great benefits for cold weather conditions because it remains fluid at very low temperatures. Uh, the, you can't mix the synthetic oils without getting in trouble. You know, it says all synthetic oils. Anytime you see on any of these questions, uh, you're going to be suspicious of any answer that says always or ever or, you know, or never or something like that. You can't just but, uh, generalize everything. Yeah, but in the, the top one, see, is an all uh, answer, but it's it's actually true. Fully synthetic oils are manufactured compared to conventional oil. Do you know what the uh, the highest grade of crude oil that comes out of the ground? You know what it looks like? The really high grade. Clear. It's clear and it's green. Looks like a, a clear bottle. My dad told me that he worked in the oil field, and you see a jar of it. It looks like clear green stuff. It does not, you know, what you would think of the black gold Texas tea look about it. I mean, a lot of it looks like that. The really good stuff is like that. Uh, technician A says some manufacturers may remove, uh, excuse me, may recommend oil changes every 7,500 miles. Uh, technician B says vehicles operating in severe duty conditions, such as dusty or low temperature operation, may require more frequent oil changes. What is what is your? Do you know, uh, Daniel? What's your uh, oil change? What's your Supposed to have for oil changes as far as intervals. How many? How many? How far is it between oil changes and your cobalt? You got any idea? What do they call for? Mm. What's the maintenance schedule look like on that? Well, I've got that oil life thing on my hood. Okay. And it usually doesn't do more than three thousand. Yeah. It tells you you need an oil change when you hit about three k. Yeah. And that's really good. I change my oil every 3,000 on everything I drive. Uh, I've never know. liked 5,000. I've never liked 7,500 personally. I just don't like that. If you're on the highway all the time, like if you're traveling salesman and you drive from here to San Antonio every week, 
you can usually get away with more distance between your oil changes. Right. Now my daddy does about do about five or six in his truck, mm -hmm. but there again, he only drives it to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Around the house. So. My wife, when I first met her, she was driving. She was doing 7,500 mile oil changes on her little Nissan Sentra that she had, and. I told her, I said, you need to be changing oil more often than this. She goes, I looked in that book and it said 7,500 and that's what I'm going with. And so I pulled the book out of the dash, you know, she was driving that day, and I pulled the book out of the glove box and I flipped it open to the severe service schedule, which she wasn't really driving all that hard. And I says, look, this is 3,000 miles. And she was confused by it. <laughs> she thought she had ruined her car <laughs> by going 7,500. I wasn't really fair when I did that, but I prefer 3,000 mile oil changes. And since that silly little car of hers didn't take but three and three eighths quarts anyway, you know, just get you a two dollar and something oil filter and some oil and pour it in there, you know. I mean, well drain the other out first. Okay. Okay, technician. Let's see. Well, let's see, both those guys are right actually on that one. What year is that car? Ninety eight, Toyota came up. Uh, technician A always inspects or replaces the drain plug gasket when performing an oil change. Technician B says warm oil holds contaminants and flows faster than cold oil. Now think about that. Think about that. If your engine's been running, you have actually got chemicals in that oil to help suspend contaminants so they don't settle. The wrong one. So if you're going to change the oil in one, isn't it smart to fire it up and get the engine all good and warm so the contaminants are floating around in the oil instead of all settled to the bottom? Because when you pour the new oil in there, if the contaminants have settled to the bottom, they're going to get caught up in the new oil, right? Yeah, it's kind of like water solubility, I guess. Like how uh, things are more water soluble and uh, how heat uh, helps things to soak into the water better. I guess the same could be applied to oil. Yep, and that oil, I always like changing the oil with the engine good and hot because it's just thin as gasoline. It runs out real fast. Yeah. And you're getting more of it out of there quicker. If you drain it out of there when you're cold, you're always thinking, well, I've still got a bunch of, you know, in the bottom of the pan. It keeps dripping and dripping. But if you do it when it's when it's good and hot, that stuff's going out of there real fast. A lot of people like to pull the dipstick out to like sort of like a vent. Is that really necessary? Like jamming a hole in the bottom of the thing if you pour it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is the crankcase sealed? Enough to where it's not going to drain out as fast unless you pull the dipstick or take the oil cap off? I don't think it'd be better. No, it's got a vent going through the air cleaner. You know, your PCV system has got to pull air in from the air cleaner or from the zip tube or whatever, from the crankcase breather. Now, if that's clogged up, you may have issues, but for the most part, it's going to drain out just about as fast whether you pull the dipstick or the oil cap off or not. Unless there's something that's getting by me, that's what they're trying to do. And something else we used to do, think about this, guys. We talked about this a little bit. You're looking for an engine oil leak, and there's two different kinds of engine oil leaks, basically. Basically, there's splash oil leaks, which are not pressurized, and then there's some where there's pressure that's pushing the oil out. Like if it happens to be in the oil gallery, you know, uh, overhead cam engines have a uh, pressurized oil lube going up through the cylinder head gasket to the camshaft bearings. If it leaks there, you're going to have a pressure leak. It's pretty nasty. If it's just a splash oil leak, in other words, if you actually, you know, splash oil being valve cover or oil pan or something like that, you know, where it's basically just oil just splashing there and it's coming out. And you can take, if you stop up the PCV and you stop up the crankcase vent and you take regulated air supply with a little hose and you put about 10 pounds of air pressure on the crankcase, you can pressure up the crankcase with shop air and spray soap bubbles and find your oil leak that way. You ever think about that? Now, Papa G's truck, and y'all are going to have to work, work on this, has got a nasty oil leak. Yeah. It's a bad oil leak. I mean, this son of a gun is painting the whole underside of the truck. Now, he uses the truck so much, he's just having to check the oil every morning right now. But sometime, probably this month, we're going to have to get that thing in here. He's going to have to get out of it, and we're going to have to find that oil leak and fix it. We meant to pull the transmission out. You don't think it's related to that last one, do you? I don't know. We'll just have to see. Well, we got to figure out where it's coming from. We put a dye in there and all that. Right. But, um, but we got to figure out where that's coming from. And whenever the whole underside of the truck is wet with oil, you know, and it's just, you got to figure out where that's coming from. If you just start throwing gaskets on it, you're going to say, well, fiddlesticks, you know. Sometimes you may swear it was a rear main seal and it turned out to be a pan gasket or something. 
and you don't know until you get the transmission and the flywheel off of it, and then all of a sudden you see the rear main seal just dry as a bone, and it's coming from the oil pan area. So. And the cool thing about that truck of his, you can pull it off, there's a cross member under the oil pan. So you can pull that little cross member out and you just drop oil pan off of it. See, it ain't really that hard on that one, which is a good thing, don't you think? All right, let's go here. Pull the uh, crown big oil pan one time without taking the uh, crown big uh, engine out. Yeah, that was on yes. crude ups. Killed it one way, killed it the other, mm -hmm. and it was a pain in the butt. We got it out though. Yep, you got it done, and it, and it ain't leaking anymore. That was crude ops. Uh, that 2000 Crown Victor crude op drive was leaking oil pretty bad. Pan gasket was messed up on it. We did the uh, rear main seal on that one too, didn't we? Yeah, I think so while we were there, we had full transmission out of it. Yeah. But anyway, he drives that thing every day now. But anyway, um, you're really supposed to um, replace the drain plug gasket technically, but that's, you know, there's so many different types of drain plug that Some of them got an O-ring on them, uh, so you always need to look at it anyway. If you're pulling it off of there and it wasn't, it looked like it was leaking from an oil drain plug before and the gasket looks okay, you can reuse it. But something they didn't address here is, and I, I talk about this, is when you're screwing that drain plug out, if it gets hard part of the way out, and you got to take it all the way out with a wrench, you better be putting a drain plug in it. You know? I mean, it's wise to put a drain plug in it if you've got that kind of a situation there. Uh, Gene Taylor's uh, truck had a uh, stripped out threads in an aluminum oil pan. And you know, you could actually just turn it turn around and around and around. And Gene says, Go ahead, what would you do about that? It's, it's, it's aluminum oil pan now, it's not, and the drain plug's fine, but the oil pan's destroyed. So how are you gonna do that without replacing the oil pan? Did you read that? We put a helicoil in it. You know, a helicoil thing where you Tap it out a size bigger, and you put a helical in there, and now you get the same thread you started with, except for stainless steel. That's what we did. And you were right. I mean, you tap it out bigger, and then you, you know, and we a one and a half thread pitch, 12 millimeter drain plug or whatever it was. I can't remember all the details on that, but we fixed it, and he ain't got a problem no more. Okay, but here, oh, what's the other problem? What's the other problem you're dealing with there? If you do that, you have to take the pan off anyways to get the metal contaminants out. Ah, well, not necessarily. What we're trying to—we're all about not doing what we don't have to do. If we want to take a pan off, we will just replace the pan. He won't worry about the money. But you fix it quicker the other way. So what do you do? And you tap the threads when you're tapping the threads. You know, if you really want to get cocky about this, you're going to tap the thread once you get started tapping the threads. What you can do is you can, or you can—you can either wait until you're done, or you can have some yo-yo uh, up top pouring. You know, like light. I mean, like. Uh, 520 engine oil or something in it. <laughs> just pouring it in and letting it go on through and while you're tapping the threads that oil engine oil is running right back out where you're tapping it's washing all that stuff out of there so it never gets into the pan. Brilliant. Huh? huh? Pretty good idea. Yeah. Now, something else my dad taught me years ago uh, at Volkswagen shop that he had over there. aluminum head sometimes people strip out the you know like some he-man want to take a, either a cross thread a spark plug or tighten it up too tight and pull the threads out of the head before the plug went and they had these little metal helicoil so you could tap it out put a you know little insert in there wasn't really helicoil so what we would do is uh, I'd say daddy how are we going to because the first time I did that you know I said how are we going to get that tap those threads out without getting a bunch of metal filings down in the cylinder and I knew that wasn't good you know even when I was 15 I knew you don't need to go there and so I says, uh, he says, uh, he stuck his air hose, and we've done this here before, stuck his air hose in the, in the carburetor, you know, just shoved it down in there and forced the plate open where the air hose in there. And then he taped the air hose where it was blowing all the time. And then we turned the motor over until there's air blowing out that spark plug hole. And there's air always blowing out the spark plug hole. And as you tap those threads, every little piece of filing that comes off of that spark plug hole is leaving. <laughs> It's going away. So you don't have them falling down in there. See, if you've got positive pressure inside and air traveling out, that's how you, that you have to think that way, you know. Have you ever seen a computer case that was in a dusty environment that was, they, they trying to keep the dust off the computer, and so they actually put fans blowing into the computer case with filters on them, and that's creating a positive pressure inside that, and it supposedly keeps dust off of that computer, right? Let me see how that would work if it's in an enclosed area and you got a couple of fans with filters on them to stop any dust from being pulled in by the fans, blowing positive pressure in there. Okay, think about this. Let's say that you're looking for a wind noise. 
on a car. I mean, we used to, when you're working at a car dealership, you may have to find a wind noise or a squeak or a rattle or something like that. And you, and you have a way of doing that. But what we do is, one of the things you can do, there's many ways you can do this. One of the things you can do is turn your air conditioner, I mean, turn your key on, and turn on your air conditioner on norm, not recirculate, you want it on norm, where it's pulling air from the outside. And you turn your blower motor on high. What that's doing is it's pulling air pressure in from the outside. Your blower motor is creating positive pressure inside the car. Right? But your doors closed, got your windows up, and you're wanting to see where this breach is that's letting this wind noise come in. Now that you got positive pressure inside the car, and you know that it's you know somewhere say on the passenger's door where they're complaining about it, you take your cigarette or your smoke machine, and you just pass that cigarette with that smoke wafting off of it by that thing, and it's going to, when it gets to that place, it's going to blow that smoke away. <laughs> and now you know that you're going to have to shim up under that little piece of rubber and make it seal tighter. You see where I'm going with that? Something else you can do, uh, we're, we're talking pressure differential here, but there's, there's another thing you can do is and take your Dr. Scholl's foot powder, because it's this white dusty stuff, and you spray it all along this white, I mean this black door trim and you close the door real gently and when you open it back up there's a place where it didn't get wiped off and that's a place where it ain't touching. You can also take Dr. Scholl's foot powder when you look for an engine oil leak and just paint the whole damn gum engine up under there with Dr. Scholl's foot powder and where it turns black first is where you're leaking. <laughs> you know I mean you see what I'm saying? If everything is the same color and it's oil's coming out it's going to stand out like a sore thumb against that black. But you think that if, if you think that way I can do this, I can do that, I can do the other. The, those guys that think that way are the ones that find the problem when everybody else is saying, I don't know what to do. You see where I'm going with that? I mean, so think that way and you'll always be a lot more successful. You gotta have a, you gotta have a, just a practical horse sense way of looking at stuff. I'll try that on my last car. Huh? I'll try that on my last Yeah, she got a wind noise? Uh, that oily. Oh, that oily, yeah, that ain't a bad idea. Dr. Scholl's foot powder don't cost very much. All right. Now, wait, where am I at here? We're talking about the drain plug. A technician B says warm oil. Oh, that's both technicians are right. So you want your oil warm, you want to make sure you pay attention to the drain plug. Replace the drain plug if you're screwing it out of a steel oil pan and it's feeling kind of hard coming out. The mistake is some people will see that the drain plug is stripped out. They'll assume that the oil pan is messed up and they'll get one of them ridiculous self-tapping drain plugs and they'll mess the threads up on the oil pan when there's nothing wrong with them. I don't know how many times I've seen that. You put the regular drain plug that it takes back in there, it'll screw right in, typically. That thing in that pan's hard as a get out, unless it's an aluminum pan. Okay, uh, number, which of the following, let's say, the, uh, is a correct statement? Undrained oil filters can usually be disposed of as regular solid waste. That ain't right. Microscopic contaminants are trapped by most oil filters. Uh, that's, you know, that's not right. Uh, the bypass valve keeps oil from draining out of the filter when the engine is shut off. Is that true? No. The anti-drain pack valve is part of the oil filter that keeps oil from draining out of the filter when the engine is shut off. Now you got, what you, what you, what you don't want to have, you, I got a hot engine, you shut it off, the oil gallery gets empty. Right? How many times have you drained the oil out of an engine and changed the engine oil, and it's an engine with a lot of miles on it, and you crank that thing up, and just for a second you hear those main bearings. You ever heard that? Just for a second, when you fire it up, you hear lug, 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 lug. And when you first start it, right after you do an oil change, you know, because when you pull the oil filter out, you know, everything drains out of there. And a lot of, uh, and your oil gallery, and a lot, on some engines will empty. On some of the old Buicks, uh, and the, they had the uh, distributor in the front, and the oil pump was on the, you know, actually the oil pump was down here on the corner of the timing cover, and the distributor passed through the timing cover and was driven by the camshaft. Those gears, you saw the oil pump you took apart, right? Now, did you take an oil pump apart over here, or was that you that did that? It's got two gears in there that mesh together. And I demonstrated the operation of an oil pump by putting it in some transmission fluid and turning the shaft, and it squirted oil out. Well, they lose their prime. Yeah. And you couldn't, you know, when you crank them up, you're watching, you better pay attention. If you crank it up, and you don't have any oil pressure, I like to watch that oil lap and or the oil pressure gauge, and when I crank it up, I want to see that thing, it'll sit there a second, and then it'll jump up. Now, some of the guys, when they're putting an oil filter on, they like to fill the oil filter up if it's one that goes on this way. 
Now, if it goes on this way or that way or that way, you can't fill the oil filter up. Obviously, you'll pour the oil out of it. But if they fill it up, it doesn't have to fill up the oil filter before it pressures up the gallery. And so they spend less time without that. Another thing you can do, if you want to be really fastidious, is take your, uh, do something to keep the engine from cranking, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, you do something safe. I'm not, you know, when you push the gas pedal on the floor, it shuts off the fuel injectors. That ain't good because if there's gas puddle up in there, it may start up. But do something to kill it. You know, yank a relay or do whatever you need to on that particular car if you know how to do it. And spin it over for about 20 seconds. Because the oil pump is filling things up then and the engine doesn't have any pressure. You're just spinning the engine, pushing the pistons. So when the pistons start getting the, you know, the punch of that combustion, <laughs> you know, that's when things start getting nasty. But if you spin it over and you prime it like that, you're less likely. See, we don't typically do that because the cars that we change oil in around are most of the time fairly healthy. You know, if you got one you're worried about, it's not a bad idea to prime it first. You know, nobody does that hardly anywhere, but it's just one of those horse sense things that, you know, can make a difference in the long run in a situation like that. I was working on a car one time that had a problem with his idle air control or something. It was an old Mercure XR4 Ti or something. I was working at Ford Place. And that thing was a piece of junk when they brought it in there. Well, I got my idle air control problem fixed on it where it would idle normally, and I took it on a test drive, and I was way off over on Denton Road, and it, I was sitting at a red light, and it started knocking and locked up. And it was a customer's car. <laughs> but it was just a junk car. And I told the, uh, and Ms. Bondi pulled out of a subdivision right there. She's happened to see me standing there. And she was driving her Mercedes, you know, and she said, you want me to call and have Robert send somebody over here to pick you up? I said, yeah, well, I don't have a, I had no cell phone in those days. You know, and she, so she, on the center of her dash, there was a little panel that opened up. There was a built-in cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and she dialed it with her pencil eraser because her fingernails were really long. But, um, incidentally, that, um, I mean, that wasn't even a big deal because of, obviously I didn't tear the car up, you know. I mean, I was a kind of, it always bothers me to have one start knocking and lock up while I'm working on it. <laughs> but, I mean, if I was working on the electronics and the bottom end of the engine, you know, went south, that wouldn't, wouldn't mean it did that. And I didn't have a reputation for driving crazy either. See, if, some, if there was some, some guy that was a hot rod nut that was always spinning the tires on customers' cars and all, I might think he blew it up. Okay. Uh, the anti-drain back valve, that's the one, D. Technician A says it's a good idea to fill the uh, new oil filter with new oil during an oil change service. Well, that's yeah, okay if you can make that happen. But like I say, that's not practical on every car. On a 350 Chevy, oh, man, that's perfect because this is right there. That's Looking straight down. Right. But try that on a Ford Taurus, you know, where it's above the starter and you're putting it up there. Eh, ain't getting there. I mean, you put a little oil in there, but you're not going to be able to fill it up. But, you know, it's a good idea if you can, right? Technician B says the lubrication system should be primed before first starting the engine after an oil change. That's what I was just talking about, uh, especially on turbocharged vehicles. What in the world is the difference if it's a turbocharged vehicle? What does that matter? Turbocharger uh, has something to do with oil. I mean, it's got it's got an oil feed to the bearings in the turbocharger. How fast does the turbocharger spin? Hundred thousand RPM. I mean, this thing just really gins up fast. That thing spools up like you wouldn't believe. And people that drive turbo vehicles are supposed to let them idle for a, about sixty seconds before they shut them off. Yeah, you know, bit basic, but most people don't. Landlord drives a uh, turbocharged diesel mm -hmm. big rig and. Uh, he went to shut that thing off or something, and something about that oil, I mean, that turbocharger sucked all the oil out and kept his engine running or something. And yeah. It caused his motor to blow up. Yeah, it'll do that. And sometimes back in a big diesel shop, you'll hear one like that, and you'll see people diving out of the way because they know it's coming apart. Hello? All right. Uh-huh. Yeah, we'll see about that. That yeah, shouldn't be. All right. May have to put some Loctite on one, a trouble one. All right. We've got a little hinges on it. We put on that glass on that vehicle. She said, one I'm trying to work loose, but we had to put some Loctite on it. Um, okay, so that's both technicians on number six. Technician A says oil pumps are always driven by the camshaft. No. That's not true. Technician B says oil pumps are always driven by the crankshaft. No. They can be driven by either one. 
Okay, what uh, what drives the what what drives the oil pump on that Toyota Camry engine that they're working on out there right now? I'd say maybe the belt. The timing belt drives it on that one. Timing belt drove on that Dodge too, I think. Yeah. Well, the the timing chain and all that. Yeah, you know. the timing chain. But uh, I've got a Toyota Camry oil pump over there somewhere on that shelf. Here's one oil pump. Here like the Dodge. Yeah, this is the one off that Dodge. That's an oil pump. What drives this oil pump here? What is it that drives Driven it? By the Daniel, you need it's to the see this. Shaft. Huh? The crankshaft. It's on the nose of the crankshaft, isn't it? Yeah. Alright, now these oil pumps have all got a relief valve in them. That's what gives you your pressure because you're pumping against a, you know, valve is pushing a spring. Alright, now that right there is what the oil pump looks like on the inside. See that? Now what kind of oil pump is this called? What's the style of oil pump that we're talking about here? Gear driven. A gerotor. That's what you're going to call a gerotor oil pump. See how it works there? And it's only... What it does is, you've got two sides to this. You see they're isolated from each other. And whenever, as it, as it makes these passages bigger on this side, it forces the oil to come in here. Whichever side it is. Maybe this side. I'm sorry, this side right here. It sucks the oil in there because it's making these passages start out little, and as it turns, they get bigger, and that causes oil to come up in here. And whenever it passes, go, gets past this Rubicon over here, it actually starts squeezing that oil out, and it has to go out the other way. It's the only thing it can do. It's going to come in one side and go out the other. And you also got some, you know, fluted, you know, stuff on that plate too. But uh, here, put that back together for me. There's that right there. Okay, there's another oil pump right here. Aha, that's the one. So this right here, this right here is the oil pump from a Toyota Camry. Okay, you see the crankshaft goes through this hole right here. And the timing belt drives a little pulley that's pulling it. Okay, but look where the relief valve is. The relief valve is over here. If that relief valve sticks, you don't have any oil pressure if it sticks open. All right, now watch this. I'm going to pull that off. And stick it down in there like that. If I can make it work, get in its place. That's how the oil pump works on that. Now, let me tell you something that's really important right here while we're talking. See, as that turns, this it works the same way that one does. See that? That's how that oil pump works right here. And of course, like I say, your relief valve's over here. It's all built in the same thing. If you replace the oil pump on this, you're actually going to get this whole shooting match, I believe. Now, this right, this cover, now watch this. This is important to remember. You see that channel around there, that triangular-looking channel? There's an O-ring that's shaped exactly like that channel that, you, that goes in there. Sometimes that O-ring will leak, and it will make a horrible oil leak. And those, those cameras, usually when they leak, they'll leak from the cam... Uh, seal and it'll run down behind the timing belt and it'll rip out the bottom and if you just look at the engine you can't see the leak unless you pull the timing cover off and oh my gosh look at all back there it's wet well we had actually re replaced the cam seal on one one time and it was still leaking and when we put the die in it it was coming from around this cover right here you see and that cover I mean it was actually dribbling from around this cover and running down there and so you, you're going to see that sometimes too on this particular kind of engine right here. These right, these little Camry engines were the engines everybody got really used to and really happy and comfortable with. And then, like most car makers, Toyota took off in a different direction, built a totally different <laughs> engine. You know, with time and change instead of a belt and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, there that is. And there's some right here. This is the oil pump off of a Lincoln. And see where is it? What drives it? It rides on the front of the of the uh, crank. See, and this right here, let's show this, is a release valve. The release valve. See that spring? There's a spring. There's a piston up in there that's not wanting to come out right now. I could get it with my magnet. And that oil is actually pushing against that. And you can inspect that. You can pull that out there. If you see that that uh, piston has moved. And there's maybe a piece of, sometimes there'll be a little piece of metal that'll come from somewhere. It'll foul that piston where it, you know, where it's pushed against its spring all the time. Then you don't have any oil pressure at all. 
So anytime you're looking at a situation where I had this one guy one time built an engine and he says I rebuilt this engine and I did a really good job putting it all back together and everything and I cranked it up and it didn't have any oil pressure and it burned it up almost right away and he said I gotta take it all back over again. So I picked up the timing cover which was kind of like it over there and I said look and then I, you could actually see it on that one I said your oil your drain relief valve is stuck. You know so whatever caused the engine to fail before got patient particles of metal in there stuck the relief valve that was something that got past him so he had to go back and do it again. You know what I mean so you better think about that. There's another one there. You know, I'm several wall pumps over there for that purpose. Okay, good to have a rag in your back pocket. Um, so that's actually neither technician. Now let's see how quick we can get through the rest of these. Which of the following is not a type of wall pump? Positive displacement, rotor, gear, negative displacement. No such thing as a negative displacement pump of any kind that I've ever seen. That's silly. I used to make up answers for quest tests that I would write. Like I come up with something like heated hydrocarbon vent. Sounds really official. There ain't, there ain't no such thing. And the guys would look at that and scratch their head, you know, try to figure it out. Uh, the following statements are correct except A, pressure regulating valves are located at the oil pump outlet. B, the drain, anti drain back valve determines maximum oil pressure. C, high viscosity oil will have a higher oil pressure than low pressure oil. And C, D, cavitation means the pump draws in air. Actually, B is the one. The anti-drain back valve does not determine maximum oil pressure. The strength of the spring on the relief valve does. And uh, sometimes I'd pull that pin out and put a washer under that spring on the oil pump and raise the pressure. Now, I've actually done that in a situation where we had already, you know, put rings and bearings in an engine and all that, and they needed the truck back that day. The oil pressure was a little bit low. You drive the pin out, and you see the spring's a little weak. Right. Now they make oil pump rebuild kits, but we said, well, we don't have time to get another oil pump in for this thing because I got to have it back today. So you take some little washers just the right size and shove them in there and you push them in there with your screwdriver and then put the pin back that's holding that spring and it gives it more tension and your oil pressure comes up. You know? Now if you've got oil pressure is low a lot of times because the bearings are loose and it's letting this pushing oil out past the bearings. And how do you find that? How do you locate that problem? Okay, what you're going to do is you're going to pull your oil pan off so you can look up in there and see, right? And then you're going to take the oil pump out of the way and you're going to find, you're going to get, you can actually take the oil pressure sending unit out in some cases and do this. And you're going to put shop air pressure in the oil gallery while you're standing under the vehicle or while you're looking up, maybe laying on a creeper looking up at the engine. And you're going to hear that air hissing out of there somewhere. You're going to see a little bit coming out around the bearings. But if you hear a lot of it hissing out around the cam bearings or something, you better put cam bearings in it because that's where your oil pressure is going. Oil gets hot, squirts out of them places just like an air is doing. And it causes your oil pressure to be low. And that starves things for oil that need to have pressurized lube, right? All right, you got that? Common sense. Okay, uh, and if it's a diesel, go ahead and plug in the block heater and let it get good and hot while you're doing it. All right, let's see. Technician A always uses a higher viscosity oil than recommended because the higher the oil pressure it provides. Technician B says, uh, high oil pressure is useless unless the volume of oil that circulates is sufficient to lubricate the engine. That's, now, let me tell you how that works. Um, there was a, or what, you know what we ran into here, there was a, um, a lady that ran her uh, Dodge Caravan low on oil and it was making a rattling noise. And so the rattling noise typically means that, you know, something's gone wrong in there that, you know, maybe it's worn out some bearings or something, oil pressure's low. And we put, we checked the oil pressure with a gauge, took the oil pressure in the unit out, screwed a gauge in there, cranked up. She had 70 pounds of oil pressure, but it was still making a rattling noise, right? Well, what happens usually in a situation like that is there is something because of the fact that the engine is trying to seize up that moves a little bit like a bearing or something that partially blocks an oil <laughs> passage, you know. And uh, so she wound up having to have an engine for that one. Now what we, you know, what you can do, and it's really surprising to me, and I grew up in a time whenever, if there was something wrong with an engine, you went in there and you tore it down and you worked on it and you fixed it. But there's a lot of shops out there that don't do that anymore. And the reason they don't do it is because of the liability. Because let's say that you, you go in there and you spend all this time, all this labor, all this energy, and you're working on you know, putting this motor back together, and you're thinking, okay, this 
I've done everything just right. Well, in some cases, in very rare cases, there will be something that you didn't catch or something like that, and you know, crank it up. They'll have trouble with it. You know, your warranty period might be three months or four thousand miles or whatever, or four months or three thousand miles or whatever you decided you're going to do. Well, just inside that warranties, you know, something else goes wrong that causes you to have to go back in there, and they just don't want to fool with that. So what they do is, some of these shops will actually buy remanufactured engines or buy engines from something like LKQ, and if they just pop an engine in there, it's usually less time consuming, and there's a warranty umbrella, because LKQ is going to guarantee what they sell you for a certain amount of time. You see that uh, transmission that we put in that state car guaranteed for I think a year or something. In, in case anything goes wrong with it, and but if you, you know, if you take it out and you tear it down and you go through all the trouble to build it and everything, and it's not quite right, or if they're not satisfied with it, you're going to, have to work on it some more. See what I'm saying? You see, you see, how it makes more sense just to drop a unit in there that was running fine that you get out of a used one, or maybe buy one from Jasper Engines or somebody like that. Whereas now Jasper won't sell anybody but a shop. See what I'm really? saying? Yeah, but LKQ will sell to anybody that you know, wants to buy an engine, so that's pretty cool about them. That one lady had to have an engine in her Chrysler Crossfire, and I think the Chrysler place was wanting $13,000 to change out the engine in that Chrysler Crossfire. So she called me about it, and I said, yeah, let me put you in touch with LKQ, and she got one from them for 1700 bucks, And they dropped it in there. And, I mean, she actually had the Chrysler place put it in, which and she got going again for a fraction of what it would have cost if she'd have been stuck with them. See? Why is it so expensive? Well, that particular engine is a... You know, one of them super duper hot rod kind of things. Use a synthetic oil. I don't know why it went bad. I mean, I don't know what happened to the engine or what fried it, but anyway, um, let's say uh, technician B is the one that's right about that. Oil pressure is useless unless the volume of the oil that circulates is sufficient to lubricate the engine. And that's what I was talking about a minute ago in that van. She had good oil pressure, but there wasn't enough volume going through there because she had some clogged up stuff because of stuff that had moved, I believe. I never tore that engine down, but I'm going to tell you something. I've got that motor over there next door, and we might tear it down just so we can see, figure out what's wrong with it. Um, what number of oil galleries is least likely to be found in a V-type engine? Now, this is the choices are four, three, one, or two. Hey, one. Yeah, one. You're going to have to have a couple of different oil galleries in a V, probably. I mean, you know, Nobody can say every time, but anyway, so that's got that took care of. And I'll go ahead and save that. All right, uh, that uh, got us took care of. Today. All right, we got some. You got some.